Hello, physical science students, and welcome to our new unit about matter. We're going to start this unit uh, by looking at matter and thermal energy. In this video, we're going to look at what kinetic theory is, the different states of matter, uh, what happens uh, when those uh, states change from one to the next, plasma is a special state of matter also, uh, what is thermal expansion, and we'll look at a few unusual substances. Let's start by looking at something called kinetic theory. Kinetic theory is basically just an explanation of how gas particles behave. And in order to apply this theory, there are some very basic assumptions that have to be followed. So kinetic theory starts with these four different assumptions. First, that all matter is composed of tiny particles. Second, that those particles are constantly in motion, and that motion is random. Third, that the particles collide and bump into each other as well as into the container that they're in. And four, that the energy loss from these little collisions is negligible. So now when we look at the different states of matter, um, the kinetic theory helps us understand that the particles that make up a gas, a substance that is a gas, will be colliding with each other with the walls of the container and so therefore they do not have a fixed volume or a fixed shape. Now let's take a look at liquids. Even though the kinetic theory is for explaining behaviors of gases, we can use some aspects of that theory to um, apply to liquids and solids as well. Um, particles that are in the liquid state here are constantly moving, just like the uh, gas particles are constantly moving, but the liquid particles are not moving as quickly as those in the gaseous state. And so they have less kinetic energy in this liquid state. Because they have less energy, they're not able to overcome their attractions to each other. So they slide past each other, they allow the liquid to flow, take the shape of the container, but because they cannot completely overcome those attractive forces between each other, the particles cling together, and that gives liquid a definite volume. Now let's take a look at solids. A solid, unlike the uh, liquid and the gas, definitely has a definite shape and volume. The particles in a solid actually are in motion, uh, but they are packed so tightly together that there is very little motion and very little kinetic energy. So those particles are unable to overcome their attractions to each other at all. A lot of times solids are crystalline, and that means that their particles have very specific geometric arrangements. Remember talking about thermal energy. Thermal energy is the total energy of a material's particles. It includes both its kinetic energy and its potential energy. It is this thermal energy that causes the little molecules and particles to vibrate. Remember, even in the ice cubes, there is motion in those particles. It's just very, very small. If we take a look at this uh, a situation where we have ice cubes placed in liquid water, um, and we think about it on a molecular level, here's say, is the ice cube, and here's the liquid water moving a little bit faster um, than the particles within the ice. The energy from the particles of the liquid water is actually transferred as it bumps into the particles of solid ice, and that transfer of energy melts the ice a little bit and cools the water. Temperature, if you'll remember, is the average kinetic energy of the particles. So on average, uh, molecules of solid water at zero degrees Celsius temperature will have less kinetic energy than the molecules of this liquid water at maybe 15 degrees Celsius. So what happens when we add thermal energy to a solid? When we add thermal energy to any solid, if the particles that make up that solid get enough kinetic energy to overcome the attractive forces that hold them in their crystalline structure, that solid will melt, and it will change from a solid into a liquid form. Um, as uh, we add more and more thermal energy to matter, the state of matter changes from solid to liquid to gas, and then we'll talk about plasmas later. So in our example with our ice cube and our water, when enough 
thermal energy is transferred from the water molecules to the ice cube, um, they will overcome their crystalline structure, their attractive forces in their crystalline structure, and will melt. The temperature at which a solid becomes a liquid is called its melting point. And remember, energy is required to change a substance from a solid to a liquid in, and um, to achieve this melting. And there's a special term for that energy. It's called the heat of fusion. So what would the reverse process of melting be? You all know that. It would be freezing. And the freezing point of a substance is the temperature at which that uh, substance as a liquid will turn into a solid. Take note that when <clears throat> a substance freezes, energy is removed from it. Now, let's look at some other uh, state changes. Let's look at um, a liquid becoming a gas. How does that happen? Remember that the, the molecules and the particles making up a liquid are constantly moving, and when they move fast enough to escape the attractive forces of the other particles, they can enter the gas state, and this is called vaporization. Vaporization can happen two ways, uh, either by evaporating or by boiling. Um, evaporation is when we have a liquid and the molecules that are right on the surface have enough kinetic energy to escape the attractive forces of that liquid. Boiling, um, unlike evaporating, it happens at a very specific temperature, depending on the pressure of the surface of that liquid. And for boiling to occur, the substance, the liquid, needs to achieve its boiling point. And the boiling point is the temperature at which the pressure of the vapor in that liquid equals the external pressure that pushes down on the surface of the liquid. So that external pressure that's pushing down on the surface of the liquid keeps those particles from escaping. So at the boiling point, those pressures are now equal. Um, and the uh, molecules can escape, the particles can escape. So particles require energy to overcome this pressure, and we have a special term for this energy. It's called the heat of vaporization. The heat of vaporization is the energy required for a liquid to become a gas at that boiling point. The opposite of vaporization is condensation. That is when enough energy has been removed from a gas so that it becomes a liquid. And what do we call it when we have a solid and it is able to change directly into a gas, it's called sublimation. Frozen carbon dioxide, otherwise known as dry ice, is a substance that um, you've probably been familiar with. It undergoes sublimation. And the opposite of sublimation is simply deposition. Now let's take a look at a heating curve. A heating curve is a special name for a graph of temperature here versus time. Uh, for heating a particular substance. And this is a heating curve for 1.0 kilograms of water that's being shown. And it shows how the temperature changes over time as more thermal energy is added on a constant and continual basis. So notice there are two flat areas here on the graph where the temperature is not changing at all. That's because if we're starting with um, ice, and we have solid water here, um, and thermal energy is being added, at this point, the ice is melting, and all of the thermal energy that is being put into the ice is being used to overcome the attractive forces between the particles. So this indicates that the temperature is remaining constant during that melting process. After these attractive forces are overcome at this point, the particles move freely and their temperature increases again. And then it stops right here because the water is boiling. The temperature remains constant while that water is boiling, and the graph is flat right there. All of the energy that's being put into the water during this time is going into overcoming the remaining attractive forces between the particles until all of those particles are in the gas state. Now let's take a look at one more state of matter. Actually, the states of matter we've looked at so far, solid, liquid, and gas, are incredibly rare in the universe. Um, we just don't see them very often. By far, the most common state of matter in the universe is 
the plasma state. And the plasma state comprises the sun, um, most of the matter between stars and galaxies is also in the plasma state. What is the plasma state? It's a very high energy state beyond the gas state. Uh, when those collisions in that gas state end up stripping the atoms of their electrons, uh, they end up becoming a plasma state, and that is what most of the matter in the universe is made of. Now let's take a look at this idea called thermal expansion. It's simply the idea that a substance will increase in size when its temperature increases. Um, the particles are moving faster, further apart, and as the uh, substance has more energy, um, it will expand and take up a greater volume. Oppos the opposite would be true. When a warm substance cools down, it would uh, shrink into a smaller volume. This is the idea behind thermometers. Um, as the mercury is getting warmer, it will expand and be forced up the, uh, the glass tube here. Hot air balloons also work by the same principle. So if this is true about thermal expansion, what's up with water? Because we've all learned that water is very unique and very special and different, and it actually expands when it freezes. Why is that? Well, that's because water molecules are polar. They have very highly positive and highly negatively charged areas. And those charged regions within the water molecule affect its behavior. When water freezes, those positively and negatively charged ends on that water molecule interact, and they force water to create empty spaces in that crystal lattice when it is a solid. And as you've all learned in biology class, we know that ice, therefore, it takes up greater space, more volume, and is less dense. And that's why ice floats in liquid water. There are a few other substances that also have very unusual behaviors when they're changing states and that do not act uh, as we would expect them to. One uh, is called amorphous solids. What are those? Glass is actually ex an example here as a glass blower heating up that glass. Amorphous solids lack repeating crystalline structures uh, like most other solids have. And so instead of melting at a very specific temperature, uh, they become soft and increasingly softer and, and they will melt over a temperature range. And what happens is they become very malleable um, and that's uh, a different property than most solids exhibit. Another strange behaving uh, matter is liquid crystals. Now most solids, when they melt, lose their uh, crystalline arrangement, their ge geometric arrangement of their solid state. Liquid crystals, however, do not entirely lose that ordered arrangement when they melt. Um, they also are highly responsive to temperature changes and electric fields, and because of their unique properties, they're very useful in making what you've heard before, liquid crystal displays or LCDs for cell phones, calculators, notebooks, different things like that. Here are some advanced ideas for you. Read through these, see if you'd like to do some of them, and I look forward to seeing you in class.